And uh, welcome. The, uh, you know, the good thing about having a, few, a, s a very small number of people here is that you can tell everybody, oh, it was the, be it was the best presentation and there's nobody else to refute you, right? So, <laughs> um, My name, uh, as, uh, as you just heard, is Peter Chenoweth. I'm uh, currently, I'm, I'm a minister in the United Church of Canada with the, in Yellowknife. Um, and I'm on sabbatical. That's one of the wonderful things that our, um, our church denomination offers and, and the congregation that I serve um, is that after five years in a pastoral relationship, uh, you can uh, apply for a sabbatical. I um, I waited a couple more years, so I've been I've been in Yellowknife for seven years. And uh, when um, when you apply for a sabbatical, you need to give a, a proposal for what you're going to do. And I'm pretty sure that nobody else in the United Church of Canada has uh, done a sabbatical on open source. But what I'm discovering, and I hope you'll find out during this presentation, that uh, that some of the things I'm discovering have a lot of applicability not just to, uh, to church, but uh, to what's happening in the world. And uh, so hopefully uh, you'll, you'll be there. And part of, it, part of this is also to, be, uh, to be interact with you, because that's part of what I'm doing on sabbatical, is, is talking to people about open source and people who work in open source, use open source, and so on. Um, I was talking to somebody last night at dinner, and I said, I probably come uh, to, to Afsos um, from the furthest distance, both geographically, because I live in Yellowknife, and vocationally, because I'm a United Church minister. Um, but uh, you'll find out that I have connections with the open source community in other ways, too. So welcome, and thanks for coming. So here's what we're going to do today. Um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about my story. And then I'm going to give you a subjective history, a subjective subjective because it's my, my take on it. So that's why it's subjective. History of open source. And then um, that should also say an historical canon, not the historical canon. Uh, some books that I've read that, uh, that I think are applicable to this uh, topic. And then why I chose this as a sabbatical topic. And, um, and then what I've learned. And as I said a moment ago, the research uh, that I'm doing on my sabbatical continues with people like you. So uh, I look forward to the questions that follow. So what does a person like you, what's a person like you doing in a place like this? That's what you might ask and say, what's the United Church minister doing at an open source software conference or an hardware conference? Well, for me, it all started one day about this time of year, mid-October, I think, 1971, um, at the University of Waterloo. I was a high school student, grade 13. You know how long ago that was, because we still had grade 13 back then. And good math students had the opportunity to go to the University of Waterloo, learn a little uh, programming language called Tutor, and uh, which is basically just uh, uh, a calculator using you know, a great big IBM, uh, I don't know what it was back then, probably a 1620 computer to be a calculator. But I was totally, completely hooked in about two hours. And you had to line up, you know, hand in your punch cards, run your program, you get the output, you have to see what mistakes you made on the punch cards, and so on. And I was completely and totally hooked on computers. Uh, at, to that point, I had not really um, had knew what I, w I didn't know what I wanted to do for my career. I came home just glowing. I said, I want to go to the University of Waterloo. I want to take computer science. This is what I want to do for the rest of my life. My dad, who was usually quite an optimist, uh, said, well, you'll outgrow that in two weeks. And uh, I still haven't outgrown it, as you'll find out. So there's where I went. That's what the math building at Waterloo lo looked like around that time. And if you walked in the building, Walked, into the, walked in here to that, uh, on the second floor, and looked down, you'd see these, this row of this, um, all these windows looking down onto the, the, the uh, Holy of Holies down there, and all these, those computers. Those were mainframe computers. I'm not even sure what they were. And uh, all the operators were down there in their lab coats, you know, cause, and you weren't allowed to touch them. The closest you could get to that was to, you know, submit something on a, in a, at a terminal, in a terminal room somewhere up here on the, on the second floor, probably at the back, whoops. And, uh, and then it would run on the computers and then you get your output. So uh, that was in the fall of 1971. Just, uh, I, because I live in Yellowknife, I don't get a chance to visit my alma mater very often. And I think the last time I was there was in 2004 and I just drove around a little bit. But I, uh, so I went back last Tuesday and uh, the building's still there. There's a lot more buildings, and when you walk up onto the second floor now, there's no windows. <laughs> it's just, uh, there, well, there's some windows there, but there's, uh, they're just terminal rooms and so on. They've obviously put in a new floor all across there, so you're, you're nodding. You've, uh, are you, you've been there? Yeah. 
So, so when I was at Waterloo, um, I found myself rubbing elbows with the hacker community that gathered in places like Waterloo um, in, in that era, in the, in the um, early 70s, early, early, in, early and mid 70s. Um, I would uh, walk by some terminal rooms and you see this, this huddle of people huddled, you know, huddled over a, a computer terminal. And um, I was fascinated by that. Um, and I was very, uh, very addicted to computers and just loved what I was doing there and so on. But I can re al almost remember making a conscious decision not to join uh, Hackerdom. Like, I, you know, I was very attracted to that in some ways, but I also thought, thought well, you know, um, do I really want to do this? Because I had the feeling that they weren't that committed to their schoolwork, these people. And, and my research since then proves that, actually, that, that they weren't committed to schoolwork. They were very passionate people, and they were very skilled people, but they weren't particularly committed to their schoolwork. And I, being the son of two teachers, I had to be committed to schoolwork, and so I had, to, I had to get good marks. And so that was one factor. And I also realized that I was too interested in having a life outside of hackerdom. Um, it, uh, you know, there were other things that appealed to me, even though the computers were the, were the, were the most important thing in my life. Um, there were other things that were pretty important to me. And so, uh, again, that contributed to my, uh, to my decision not to join Hackerdom. And also, you know, that's a little bit of nagging doubt. Do I really have the right stuff to be a hacker? Um, do I? And I'm, I'm convinced that, uh, that it's, it's partly something that you learn. Like, you, can, you, can, you have to have a certain amount of smarts to be a hacker, but you also learn a lot because it's a community exercise, as, as, you'll, as you'll hear me say. So I did graduate, and I uh, eventually ended up as a systems programmer on GCOS. Anybody know what GCOS stands for? GCOS actually started as this General Electric comprehensive operating system. Um, it was General Electric was in the computer business back in the, in the early 60s, and they came up with uh, an operating system called GCOS. Honeywell brought, bought them out, and so they took the E out and called it uh, General Comprehensive Operating System. It was actually a really, really good operating system. You know, a big mainframe computer operating system. And it was a really good operating system because it, in, it incorporated um, both a batch processing environment and a time sharing environment, which really was an awful lot like what computing is like today, where you had a terminal and it looked like you had, you had sole use of the, of the script you could your mainframe computer, but it just spliced time. So that, you know, there'd be 50 people on the computer at the same time. They all looked like they had sole control of the computer. Meanwhile, there's a whole bunch of batch processes. So those of us who are in the, the systems guys really liked it, so we called it God's chosen operating system. <laughs> um, it took me a few years to realize that it really, I mean, it really, it was, it was a very good uh, operating system, but it took me a few years to realize that it wasn't really God's chosen operating system. It was just a small portion of it. And so my, my joke was when I left, when I left programming, um, at systems programming to, uh, to go into ministry, to go to school at seminary, I said, I realized you know, after nine years that uh, it's not really God's chosen operating system, so I'm leaving to take training on becoming a systems analyst in what's really God's operating system. But I also realized when I left uh, computer, the computer industry that even, even though I didn't know that I, if I had the right stuff back then, I realized that I did because, it's ha because computers have been a part of my life uh, ever since, never been far from them. One of my friends uh, says that, um, she, she, she says that I'm the best example she knows of a cyborg in all the positive ways you can imagine that because I'm never, never far from a computer and have uh, taught a lot of people how to use computers and have really spent my life trying to figure out what the intersection is between theology and technology. And, uh, Actually, this sabbatical has actually given me uh, uh, sort of an epiphany around that. So, um, so that's a little bit about me. Um, here's, uh, as I said, a subjective history of open source. In um, it's the prehistory to open source, although it's really not a prehistory because actually open source started with the hacker communities at places like uh, MIT. And um, it, I don't think UW gets enough credit for. Uh, for what happened back in the 70s. Uh, MIT um, certainly gets most of the credit, um, and, the, and then places like Stanford and Carnegie Mellon in the States. But there was a really significant and, uh, and uh, respected uh, hacker community at UW as well, University of Waterloo. And um, so back um, in those days, if you were 
a computer fanatic, um, you had to go you had to go to a place where there were computers because they were in big rooms and they were water cooled and you know they cost uh, million, millions and thousands if not millions of dollars or hundreds of thousands if not millions, millions of dollars. So um, the place that attracted people the most were universities um, because they had they had uh, computers and they would also had computers that you could get time on. If, if you were working for a company, you know, the, you, you didn't have access to the computers and they were already doing stuff and so on. So places like UW and MIT and Carnegie Mellon and, and Stanford attracted people who were very, who, like me, who were very attracted to computers and uh, wanted to, quote, play with them and uh, did some amazing stuff with them. Um, Stephen Levy um, has written a book. It's actually quite an old book now, but he actually updated it uh, in a few years ago, and uh, O'Reilly, which is a, um, do you know about O'Reilly? They're a big open source publisher. So they, they did a, they did a something anniversary, 20th anniversary edition, and he added a 25th anniversary edition of, of it. So Stephen Levy, he's a journalist, but he's been, he's been a journalist in, um, in uh, sort of technology areas uh, most of his life. He, he's, his more recent books he wrote in the uh, life and the, Anyway, he, w he went and toured Google's uh, offices and he called it Life in the Plex or something like that. I haven't read that book, but it apparently it's quite a neat book. And he's done lots of, lots of similar things. So in his book, he talks about what the hacker ethic is. The hacker ethic is access to computers and anything that teaches you something about the way the world works should be unlimited and total. And if there's a choice between not getting your hands on it or getting your hands on it, you should always yield to getting your hands on it. So you always yield to the hands-on imperative. Um, hackers back in those days were well known for uh, being uh, lock pickers because it wasn't just computers they needed access to. They needed rooms where, you know, they wanted to get access to rooms and so on. So they would all, they would all take uh, correspondence courses, or not all, but many of them would take correspondence courses and learn how to, you know, learn how to um, do key, key locks and so on and pick locks just because they didn't think the door should be locked. They, they would often break in to rooms and never take anything or do anything. They just, because they said, no, these doors should be, they shouldn't be locked, they should be open. So that's kind of the hands-on thing. They also said that all information should be free. Anything, any, you should be able to find out how anything works and you should know any, everything about anything if you want to. Um, they also said that you should mistrust authority and promote decentralization. Um, and then this one, hackers. Now, whenever I say hackers, I'm talking about the good hackers, the white hat hackers. Hackers who hack away on computers and do good things and create beautiful code and so on. Not the way the media portrays hackers in this day and age. Um, the people who, who break into systems and do malicious stuff and so on. Um, real hackers call them crackers and would prefer that that's how they be named. Um, often they're sometimes called black hat hackers. I'm not talking about them at all. Um, they're, they're bad people, they do bad things. But uh, when I say hackers, I'm, uh, it's a positive word I'm using. So hackers should be judged by their hacking, not bogus, bogus criteria such as degrees. Like it didn't, so what if you got a degree? Show me what you can write, what you've written. Uh, so what? So what if you're, you know, aging like me? If you've written good code and you're still writing good code, that's all I need to know. Um, what race or what position you hold? None of those things count. What counts is the code that you've written. Show me the code, and th that's how I will judge you. Um, Finally, you can create art and beauty on a computer. In other words, computers are, computers are not really scientific instruments. They are, um, they are uh, artistic instruments. So that, as I said, the, ha the hacker community is gathered, gathered in, uh, at universities and academic institutions because that's where you could get your hands on computers and so on. Then what happened? The dawn of the personal computer. Anybody recognize any of those? That's a Commodore 64 at the bottom. Any others? Apple II and the IBM PC. Okay. <laughs> so here's what happened when computers, be when you could take them home. The hands-on imperative went home. All of a sudden, I don't need to go to an academic institution. And by the way, those hackers often never finished any courses. Some of them got master's degrees, 
just by doing what they did, you know, for writing code. They got master's degrees. Often they just got really, really good paying jobs with uh, companies without any degrees because they were judged by their code. Well, they never completed any courses because it was, they, 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 you know, they could have aced them probably, but they just didn't go because they were too busy hacking uh, on uh, terminals somewhere. So the first thing is the hands-on imperative goes home. So now, basically the hacker community is completely distributed. You could take a computer home, you could do whatever you want with it in the, in the privacy of your own home. Um, you, didn't have, you didn't even have to report to a boss anymore. Um, the rise of the internet and information freedom takes a quantum leap. All of a sudden, not only was information free, but it was freely available. Um, very easy to get to. And uh, I think that's still, you know, that's still part of who, who, uh, who we are as a society now. Um, Gen X, anybody know what that means? Gen X, Gen Y, and the millennials. And I call the nothing but net generations. So generations that have grown up knowing nothing but the internet. Um, I'm not in that category. I don't know how old you have to, how young you have to be to be in that category. Probably about under, like 25, maybe. So, yeah. Some of you are fairly young. Have you, have you ever known anything but the net? You have? Okay. How old are you? If you don't mind saying, let me say. 22, okay. Okay. BBS. Yeah, BBS. Yeah. Yeah. So, and then, um, so information freedom and hands on. With the, with the new generation are taken for granted. I mean, they, they, they never know anything else. So, present day. Open source has really caught on. Uh, companies, like big companies like Intel, Google, Twitter, embracing open source. Now, there's some, you know, remember we're talking about open source, not free software. Free as in speech, not as in beer, is the way that it gets said. Even Microsoft, who used to be the most anti uh, open source company around um, have to embrace might have to embrace open source, you know, because they're running cloud servers, uh, which have to run Linux, and so they and, and so they have to be they have to at least know about open source, and they're even releasing some code as open source. Um, Apple, which has been quoted to me as being the most closed company in existence today, also even has some connection with. Do you know what Cups is? The common uni Unix printing system. They bought the company that, 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 that wrote Cups, and Cups is open source, and uh, so even they, they did it. And it's how you run your printers, basically on Linux, usually. Um, and I've been told, I haven't checked it yet, but if you've got an iPhone and you go into the settings and you go to About, if you look in the About, there's a G, the GPL is in there. There's reference to the GPL. So they're using some open source software as well. They're not releasing any. <laughs> the future. Well, I mean, who, who of us really know what's going to happen in the future? But stay tuned. Uh, not to me, necessarily. Maybe to me, but stay tuned. So here's, where, here's, here's what I've been reading, and here's uh, uh, just some recommendations of uh, books. And most of them are over there on the table, if you want to take a look at them. I've already mentioned uh, Stephen Levy and uh, um, Hackers, the Heroes of the Computer Revolution. He, um, and he's the one who came up with the hacker ethic. Um, Second Self by Sherry Turkle. She wrote that in the, in the late 80s um, and talks about the hacker community at MIT. She's an MIT professor and, um, and has some really, it's a really fascinating book about, uh, about how computers have changed our lives in some ways um, and how computers really changed our lives, not, not in, you know, they changed our lives like cars did, but they changed our lives because we redefine ourselves. Like even people that work in artificial intelligence now, t like we, because they've been working on artificial intelligence, they started to think that maybe people are like computers. Like we start to think that we're like the machines that we're creating. Um, and so there's, you know, they're trying to say instead of modeling computers after the way humans think, we're, they're sort of saying, well, humans think the way computers do, those sort of things. So it's really, it really effectively changed the way that we think about ourselves. Um, David Lockhead, I knew him. A beautiful little book called Theology in a Digital World. Um, he, I, he could have been my professor, but I chose to go to a different college. I didn't know about him, so I, I chose to go to a different college, and I'm happy I went there. But I wish I'd, I wish I'd met David a little earlier in my life. Beautiful, beautiful book. Um, you read it, and it looks like he, re he wrote it last week, but he wrote it again in the, in, um, the late 80s, I think. Uh, 
but and how he talks about how computers are possibility machines, and as a result of that, they they uh, read in, in some ways redefines the way we think about the world and uh, and everything. Um, anybody heard of the Cathedral in the Bazaar by Eric Raymond? It's probably the first and still often quoted book on open source. Um, just this week, this week I found uh, just for fun. I've been staying with my sister in Ajax, and I went to the Ajax the library to do some work on this presentation and so, uh, do some reading and stuff. And I found the book by Linus uh, called Just for Fun. It's a great book. Uh, he wrote it with David Diamond, and uh, it's a really fascinating story. It's about ten years old now. Um, and just to prove that the hacker ethic has got some attraction in the world, uh, Pekka Heimanen, who's um, who's a uh, psychologist. In, at Stanford University, wrote a book. Uh, it's quite an academic book on the hacker ethic, but he's talk, he basically talks about how the hacker ethic um, is redefining uh, the ethic that we live by. He, t he takes the Protestant work ethic and uh, and compares it to the hacker ethic and how things have changed completely or changing completely because of it. I think that's a book that should be uh, that should be read by more people. Um, right now, I'm reading a book. Uh, by Samir Chopra and uh, Scott Dexter called Decoding Liberation. And uh, it's, um, it's a great book. I, unfortunately, I took it out from the University of Waterloo Library. Anybody going back there before next Tuesday? <laughs> I, have, I have some books to be taken back. And uh, I think I can take them to the York. Uh, does somebody want to let that person in? Welcome. Hi. It's okay. So I, I feel kind of um, I feel kind of uh, justified because I just re finished reading the first uh, chapter of uh, Decoding Liberation, and and Samir Chopra and Scott uh, Dexter give a history of uh, open source, and it's pretty much the one that I came up with. So I think I'm on the right track, or at least we're all on the wrong track, or something like that. Um, this is a great book, We Think, by Charles Ledbetter. When I was a student, I, um, I hardly ever you know, t took a highlighter and, and highlighted passages and so on. This book, I couldn't stop. Uh, I didn't highlight it, but I, I couldn't stop stopping and you know, taking notes on my, uh, on my Android phone uh, uh, references because it was just a, it, it's a business book, but I found that the connections with, uh, with my life as, as a, as a in, in ministry with the church congregation and the business world and so on, it's just basically talking about um, uh, the new spirit of collaboration, which is what open source is all about. Um, we, the Wisdom of Crowds is, is a, again, an interesting book. And The Empathic Civilization, a great big 700-page book. There's a chapter in there where he talks about, uh, um, what's he call it? Distributed capitalism, which is really all about open source, more than just open source software, open source everything. And uh, Wikinomics, it's over there too. I have actually. I've found so many references to that book, but it, it's on my list, and I've actually got it, but I haven't read it yet. So, but it, I, there's enough references to it that I think it must be a good one. So why, why did I want to do this sabbatical? Well, for me, it's a two-sided question. There's the I why, why am I working on this? But it also is the they why. So why do people, why would people write open source? Why would they do it um, with no thought of uh, financial um, reward? Um, and uh, and why, you know, what, what's the point of doing that? Um, and so to answer that question, I asked myself, you know, why would I write open source? And uh, I think some of my answers are the same as some other people who, who write open source would be. Um, I'm going to tell you, I want to, to sort of explain the I why, I'm going to tell you two stories. Um, the jokes, really, and I hope nobody's offended by this. Uh, they're self-effacing jokes because I have Scottish heritage. So the first one is the invention of copper wire. Has ever, anybody ever heard how copper wire got invented? Two Scotsmen arguing over a penny. Okay. <laughs> and the second one is a story about car a carnival uh, from a number of years ago. There was this carnival, and uh, there was a big tent. And there was a barker out there, and you know, barker inviting people to come into the tent to see the strong, the strong man, right? And there was kind of like a boxing ring in the middle of this tent, and the crowds were all around the, the boxing ring. And um, there's this great big, you know, hulking strong man in there, and he comes up, gets up on up, up in the boxing ring, and the 
Barker hands him a lemon. And he says, squeeze, so he says to the strong man, squeeze the lemon. So he squeezes the lemon, squeezes it, squeezes it, squeezes it, and the drops, you know, the lemon juice all comes out until there's no lemon juice left. So he, um, so then he invites the crowd. Anybody that can come up and get one more drop out of this lemon um, gets 100 bucks. It, it was long ago, so 100 bucks was a pretty good thing, right? So, uh, so a couple of, you know, big looking guys get up there and they squeeze the lemon, no drops get out of it. And finally the scrawny little guy gets up there and, you know, sort of saunters up there and everybody's laughing like crazy, like, you know, two guys couldn't do it. Why would he think he could? So the scrawny little guy gets up there, he starts squeezing the lemon and a drop comes out. Everybody's just totally amazed and the, the barker says to him, well, how'd you do that? He said, two strong, you know, one strong man and then these two other fellows couldn't do it. How did you get, lem how did you get a, a drop of lemon out of that, um, out of a, drop of, uh, a lemon drop out of that? He said, it's easy. He said, I've been a church treasurer for 20 years. So that's why I wanted to do it. Because you see, I saw churches are always, in a, it seems to me that churches are always in a financial crisis. And if they have lots of money, they don't want to spend it on things that they don't think are useful. Okay? They want to spend it on, they want to spend it to help people, to help the common good and so on. So I said, well, so why are we, why are we spending so, so much money on software in churches? You know, like so many churches that have Microsoft everything, and you know, back when it was 700 bucks to buy that, I said, 700 bucks, that's a lot of money. And there's a free repository of software out there that works, that's beautiful, that works fantastically, and not only if you use it, the community will be improved and so on. So that's part of it. So, you know, like the, you know, arguing over a, cop over a copper, uh, squeezing lemon out of a lemonade, or squeezing uh, lemonade out of a lemon, I wanted, I thought, it, there, I thought there was something there that the church community could benefit from. But as I got further involved in this, and started using more and more open source software, I realized that, that as much as free as in beer was a good thing, um, free as in speech was much more important. Um, as somebody I read said, you know, free beer is nice, but free speech is worth dying for, okay? It's a different kind of need, a different kind of Im uh, importance. So then I sort of asked my question, well, why would I write open source software? Well, part of it would be, for re and this is just me, but I'm interested to know if other people feel the same way about this, is I feel it's a way of paying it forward as gratitude for a gift I received. I've never, like, I've never really quite understood why I was given this talent, this, this particular talent uh, with computers, um, you know, to be able to explain things that just intuitively comes to me. I just seem to know how things work and, you know, explain it to everybody else and teach people how to use it and so on. I've done a lot of work to make myself better on it. I mean, I, everything I learned in university, I, you know, hardly anything ever, it's all been self-taught. But I, I, I know how to do it and I learned how to do it. And so, I see it as a gift that I've received. Now for me, I mean, I would say, you know, is a God-given gift. I'm not sure that other people would say that, but where do you get, you know, it's just sort of the question, where do you get talent from? Where does skill and ability come from? So, so if, I'm, if I'm contributing open source to the community, it's just as a way of saying thanks for the gift that I had, that I, that I received. And also that it's enough to know that I'm contributing to the common good in some small way. This is the only Bible quotation you'll hear in this, but I think it's really important. The other part of this is that when I read um, in Acts, the book of Acts is a story of the beginnings of the Christian church, um, verses like this. And all the believers lived in a wonderful harmony, holding everything in common. They sold whatever they owned and pooled, they sold whatever they owned and pooled their resources so that each person's need was met. So that's one. And then the second one, the whole congregation of believers was united as one, one heart, one mind, they didn't even claim ownership of their own possessions. No one said, that's mine, you can't have it. They shared everything. So when I look at that, I mean, that's a, it's kind of, people say that's a utopian vision of what, you know, life was like. Did it really exist? We don't really know. But when I start looking for modern day examples, maybe small microcosm examples of that, I see that sharing and collaboration and an ethic that places capital in the community and that that sounds like the hacker ethic. And uh, I'm reading, uh, as I said, I'm reading Decoding Liberation by Chopra and uh, Dexter. And uh, I think they have a lot of, uh, there's a lot of connection with what they say as well. Um, a discussion of the political economy and how um, open source, you know, changes 
things. It changes business models. It changes the way we, we, we see the world and so on. And, and uh, so it's all about sh uh, sharing and collaboration. That's a little code. Anybody know what that means? Richard Stallman. Richard Stallman. Anybody know who Richard Stallman is? We owe an awful, yeah, there's a few people. We, we owe an awful lot to Richard Stallman. He said that information should be free, should be free and he's the one who came up with the phrase, information should be free, free as in speech, not as in beer. I, I put that, I put that, pre, those, that previous, uh, I put this one in, because I'm just curious to see, because to me, RMS defines a line. And if you're on one side of it, and you don't have a clue what, if, if you think it means root means squared, or you don't have a clue what it means, whose initials they are, then, then uh, some of this stuff's going over your head. But if you do know who Richard Stallman is, then you kind of get it, and I don't, almost don't have to give you the talk. But, uh, so there it is. So, so in order to check out my theories, um, here's what I have to do. If I'm going to equate early hacker community with present day open source community, then I need to go where the hackers are. So as you can see, I attended LinuxCon North America in, uh, in, at the end of August. I intended to go to Ohio Linux Fest in Columbus, Ohio at the end of September. Uh, things got complicated in my life and it made more sense, so you're the lucky beneficiaries of this, it made more sense for me to go to a Canadian uh, conference at the end of October, so here I am. I was planning to come anyway, but I applied to uh, do a presentation and wonder of wonders I got accepted, so that's why I'm here today. That was in, oh yeah, LinuxCon North America was in San Diego. So here's a little bit about what happened for me there. I was mingling with people who are involved in the Linux community. Everybody knows who Tux is, right? Yeah. Met people. So I, so I mean, I was wandering around with a name tag, you know, like this, Peter Chanel, the United Church of Canada. I was the only one there. I mean, I was a, I had come not probably the furthest distance of that conference too, both geographically and vocationally, um, and kind of walking around embarrassedly saying United Church of Canada uh, because I didn't, you know. People, as soon as they see it, you know, they make assumptions. And some of the assumptions were really what I expected, and other assumptions were it was a really good sort of uh, connection with people. Well, what are you doing here for the United Church of Canada? So I explained my sabbatical project, and a lot of people said, wow, that's, that's really neat, that's fantastic, uh, and started talking to me about why they write open source software. Uh, so I met people from Red Hat, Google, Canonical, you know, Canonical is, right? They're the behind, people behind Ubuntu. Ubuntu Linux, uh, CentOS, and the Linux Foundation, which of course uh, funds uh, Linux uh, uh, development now. And uh, this really neat uh, bus ride I was on, um, I was sitting beside, I was sitting at, on the bus and I had an NPC beside me and it was getting quite full and this guy got on because uh, we were going to reception. And uh, I forget his name, I wish I could remember his name. He works for Red Hat, he's a, he's a kernel developer uh, with Red Hat working on um, one of the new file systems, and I can't even think of it. I, I, if you ask me, I'll, I'll be able to remember. But he uh, he sat beside me and he said, "What are you doing? Wh what are you doing here?" And he saw you know saw my name in the United Church, and so I told him. He said, "Oh, he said that's really neat." He said, "You should talk to Ted So." Well, Ted So is one of the 14 kernel developers for Linux, and he happened to be sitting, and this guy knew him. And he was sitting three rows in front of me in the bus. So he said, well, I'll introduce you uh, when we stop. So sure enough, we, the bus stopped at, at a, at the where we were having the reception. And this guy introduced me to Ted So. And, um, and uh, so I had a 15-minute conversation with Ted So about uh, why, I, you know, why I'm doing what I'm doing and why does he do what he, do, what he does. Um, you'll see, I'll say more about that. Uh, Linus Torvalds was also, also at that conference. I didn't talk to him directly, although he was uh, standing right there when I got off the elevator one time. And they had this really, really neat uh, uh, interaction because there's a 20-something who works for the Linux Foundation standing. So I'm standing on the elevator. Linus is here. And there's this guy, 20-something guy that works for the Linux Foundation over here and is helping with the conference. And so the elevator comes to the, the main floor. The door opens. I look to my right, and there's Linus Torvalds. And here's this young guy there who's obviously standing there trying to figure out whether he should say something or not. And at the moment the door opened, he said, he decided he's going to make the plunge. And so he stepped off right across in front of me. And he said, Mr. Torvalds, he said, I'm so-and-so. I work for the Linux Foundation, and it's just such a pleasure to meet you. 
and you could just see, like, it was just like a rock star. It was like somebody meeting, you know, some, some rock star. And uh, it, was just, it was really neat. And I mean, the place was absolutely, totally packed. There were maybe four or 500 people there on an ongoing basis when t Linus uh, took the stage for, the, for, the, uh, for a panel discussion. Uh, the place was swelling. It was, there were probably 1,200 people there. And just a buzz, you know how there was just a buzz in the, in the, um, and uh, also as a, as a result of that, I had an electronic introduction to Larry Wall uh, because people said you need to talk to Larry Wall uh, because of his story. And then uh, attended presentations by Brad Kuhn, who's the developer and a, um, a friend of Richard Stallman. And uh, there's Linus. And there's uh, Ted, that's Ted right there. And Sarah, I can't remember her uh, last name. And Greg Koa Hartman, those are all uh, kernel developers. And I went to this amazing uh, talk by Christoph Lameter. He was a, he's been a kernel developer. He's been in the, the, in the business for 20 years. He won a programming contest when he was a kid. Sounded like a little bit like my story. And in the middle of his talk, he said, um, he said he was talking about getting education. He's, and his, like, his theory was, don't, don't get education ahead of time. Just get it as you need it. So if you need a certification, well, you know, uh, then go get it. If somebody says you need a certification, well, then go get it. Don't go get a certification and then look for jobs because you got a certification. It's kind of, I mean, it's kind of the hacker philosophy, right? You're known by your code, not by what you've, what you've got attached to your name. Um, but in the middle of his presentation, he said, so, so that's what I did. He said, so um, you know, I was involved in a startup a few years ago, and uh, so I sold some shares and went and got a degree in theology, a PhD in theology. And I said, like, I, I, I was pretty sure I hadn't heard him right. And so I said, well, I'm going to ask him afterwards. Later on, he was answering some of their questions, and sure enough, he 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 sold some shares, um, you know, probably for several, several, you know, five digits, thousands of dollars, and used that to fund his education to do a PhD. And there's the book he wrote in his in his PhD um, in theology, and now he's back working in kernel development for the Linux Foundation. Um, so just a little bit of reflection on these. Like I've got introduced these guys because, well, I went to Christoph's uh, presentation, but I got introduced to Ted So and to Larry Wall because people said, well, they're people of faith. They're the kind of people you should be talking to. Well, really, they're not the people that I want to talk to uh, because, you see, I think they kind of get it. There's Larry. I, I've never met him in person, but I, I, we, have, we, we correspond by email. And you know, he's, got, he's working on a little project for me, uh, answering some questions that are on the back burner because he's really busy. But, uh, but at least, you know, I can prove that I've got emails from Larry Wall, which I still can't believe. So, who wrote Pearl, by the way? And he wrote Pearl. Do you know the story of Larry Wall and why he wrote Pearl? He actually is quite involved in a Christian community, the Nazarene Church in uh, Washington State. And he and his wife, he was, he was actually working in linguistics stuff. And uh, he wanted to go to Africa to help with Bible translation. And uh, when, when he, f and he found out that the tools that he would have used to do that, the, the, comp the software tools to do it, didn't exist. So he stopped that and wrote Pearl. <laughs> and Pearl is what he wanted to, to use when he went to Africa. And he actually named Pearl Pearl. It's a, it's a, it's a typical sort of ha you know, hacker name. Um, if you spell it with an A in the middle of it, then there's a famous Bible passage called the Pearl of Great Price. And so that's why he named Pearl what it is. So I w it was incredibly interesting and honored to meet these people, uh, either in, in person or, or uh, electronically. But, uh, but as I say, they're not really the folks that I wanted to meet. Um, it's really the agnostic or atheistic developer that in some ways is more interesting for me, because I want to know what their motivation is. And because uh, I think that some people, although Ted so when I talked to him, I, like, I don't it felt to me, and I only had 15 minutes, and we probably could have a late, lot longer conversation, but I didn't get the impression that he actually got it. Like, it's like his faith life was there, and his developer life was there, and they, and they didn't mix. And that surprised me a little bit, but maybe it's just because he was you know, distracted or whatever. Um, but, but really, I want to know if there's a spirit or ethic that motivates people, especially people who may not have asked the philosophical or the ethos questions. In, in a way, what my sabbatical intention is to reflect back to people who are developers more of who they are than they may have even considered thought or thought about. So I'm quickly going to go through this. Um, and it turns out I thought I was breaking new ground. Well, I'm not breaking new ground. Lots of people thought about this stuff. I've mentioned Pakihimanen. Um, 
did some research, found you know a, a list of 15 books that are precisely on uh, on my uh, on my topic. Um, use, anybody use scholar.google.com? Even know it exists? Check it out. It's uh, really neat. They give you citations of like references to scholarly works, and it's just a fantastic resource. And I don't think a lot of people even know about it. Um, it's really great if you're doing research. Um, and a lot of people have written um, on what hack why hackers do what they do, um, understanding motivation and effort in free open source software projects. I've got a book here actually. Yeah, that blue book right there has a chapter that's exactly chapter titled that. So here's what I've discovered. First of all, I think it just goes with it saying that the spirit of a movement or a community is a composite of its members. So no one person's going to define the spirit, but together there's a spirit of, of a community or a movement. And so for hackers, um, I, I started coming up with characteristics, and for some reason they all started with P. <laughs> They're playful. They're passionate, they're principled, they're proud, the prove your, they have prove yourself, they're purist, they're practical, and they're postmodern. Another way of saying that is they're subversive. They like to change things up. Um, not because they want to do that, just because it's, it just works better. And um, I think in, if you think about all those things on the hacker ethic, as I outlined before, um, that the hacker ethic really could be known as the spirit of hackerdom. And I think that open source is a marker of the present and the future age. Uh, crowdsourcing, collaboration, community developed ideas that are a sign of the times. Everybody knows about Wikipedia. It's probably the best known example of what crowdsource means. The goal of, it's, of containing the sum of all human knowledge. They're not there yet, but they're getting closer every day. And uh, Linux, of course, is the best example of how collaboration can make something that's incredibly good. And I mean, I, as I read, I just see every like people. Open is every, open is in is out there. Now, still a lot of people haven't got a clue what open source is about, but more and more, um, open is is infiltrating or being part of everything that we talk about. Open source, open education, open data, open mapping, open government, open everything. So, as I said, I've spent my whole life since uh, that day, that fateful day in 1971 at the University of Waterloo kind of trying to figure out what the intersection of technology and theology was. And for a long time, I felt like it was just, it was right there, but I could never attain it. It always seemed to be just out of grasp. About two weeks into my sabbatical, in the middle of August, I suddenly woke up one morning and said, I've got it. The intersection of technology and theology, for me at least, is open source. It's all about open source. It's all about collaboration. It's all about sharing. It's all about how I see the world, both from my faith perspective and also from what um, what I believe is God given for me. Um, because it feels better. Uh, people who are involved in open source often will just say it just feels better to be writing open source software. It feels like it's the right thing to do. Um, and that they're contributing rather than profiting. Um, that motivation, that money is not a motivator, that, that doing what you love. You know, Steve Jobs, who's, who, who was the, you know, the CEO of the most closed company in the world, gave a famous uh, convocation speech where he said, follow your passion. Well, that's what an awful, like that's what thousands and thousands and thousands of open source programmers are doing. They're following their passion without regard for whether it's going to make them rich, without regard for anything else. They're just doing it because they it makes them feel good and because they think it's the right thing to do and because it's contributing to the common good and because it's going to make the world better. And you know, in a world where there's a lot of pessimism about the way things are going, it's one place that I see some optimism. Like people really believe that they're, if they're working op in open source, they really believe that they're making the world better. Um, now they may, you know, and they may be, they may be out to lunch. Maybe technology can't solve every problem, but at least they think it can, <laughs> and that's a lot better than some, you know, some other places and so on. So, that's that's it. My presentation. If you've got questions, or if you want to follow me, uh, there's the there's my uh, blog. You can just uh, QR it if you want. Um, I'm on Twitter and I'm on uh, Facebook. I'm not a huge uh, fan of, e well, I, I like Twitter a lot. I'm not a big Facebook fan. That's kind of typical of hackers, I found out. A, a lot of hackers don't like Facebook. Uh, Linux doesn't, Linus does not use, does not use Facebook, apparently. Um, he uses email and IRC sometimes. So, and uh, there's my, my email address. 
I'm using my Linux email address. You can get a Linux email address by joining the Linux Foundation if you want one. So there I am. Masi Cho, I come from the Northwest Territories. That's how you say thank you in the Dene language. So thanks for coming. But if there are any questions, I'd be happy to answer them in uh, minus five minutes. Thanks for coming, everybody. We had a much better crowd at the end than we did at the beginning. <laughs> <laughs>